answer what we're saying. Now, isn't it time for you to take a serious look at the church of Christ? And what does the Bible say, or a word from the Lord, or Q&A? Tonight, I want you to think with me. Is it wrong for a religious person to knock the belief of another religious person? Do we live in a day where Jim Jones, remember Jim Jones, drink the Kool-Aid, where Jim Jones had actually come to the two states listening area here and he could set up house and began to teach his doctrine and get away with it? Wouldn't it be okay for us to demonstrate that he's a false teacher? I seem to remember 1 John 4, 1 saying, try the spirits. I seem to remember Revelation 2, 2 saying that those individuals there were commended because some said they were apostles and he said, you found them to be liars. They weren't apostles, and you found them to be liars, he said. You see, in the New Testament, Jesus was actually a master at demonstrating that people were teaching false doctrine. Jesus is the one who coined the phrase, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Well, I seem to remember him saying that in Matthew chapter 15. Though, how is it that if I'm the servant of Jesus, that I'm not to be doing the same thing that Jesus was doing? And that is to demonstrate when persons are not teaching what Jesus actually said. Well, let me give you a demonstration tonight, in case you actually wonder if it, if it is the case. Here is Charles Stanley. The Father had sent him from heaven. Whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Paul put it this way, call it, all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. And so all through the scripture, it's those who believe. Now somebody says, well, but now wait a minute. What about uh, me? For example, somebody would say, uh, when I was uh, just probably a few weeks after I was born, my parents had me baptized. Well, what did they have done to you? Now notice who's doing it. Your parents had you sprinkled or had you poured on. Now, friends, the only difference between myself and Charles Stanley, he's teaching against the Methodists, the Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians. He's teaching against anyone who practices infant baptism and sprinkling. The only difference between myself and Charles Stanley is, is Charles Stanley is telling you there are people out there who are teaching wrong, but he won't tell you who they are. Well, friends, if there is a person that is harmful for to, you, to you or for you, towards you, who's living on your block, I will tell you where they live, and I will tell you their name. Because, you see, a person, a predator who's living on your block, and you don't know where he lives, is, and me just telling you there's somewhere, someone is a predator. That hasn't helped you. But if I can tell you his name and where he lives, you see, I have truly warned you to watch out. Continue to listen to what Charles Stanley said. And uh, that was a form, they said, let me ask you a question. When you were eight days old, one month old, two months old, one year old, two years old, whatever it might be, was that a decision you made or was it a decision your parents made? The pa decision your parents made. Your parents can't get enough water on you or in you to make you safe. They can't do it. Now watch this. Now some of you say, well, I'm telling you right now, I know I was baptized when I was a baby, and I'm saved. Well, let me ask you a question. When you read the New Testament, is that what it says? Infant baptism is unscriptural. Now let's explain what should be understood. Infant baptism is unscriptural. Now let's explain what... Now friends, that is pretty strong. The only thing he didn't do is tell you who teaches it. Infant baptism is unscriptural. Do you know if a, thing, if a thing is not scriptural, you know what that means? It didn't come from Jesus. Well, if it didn't come to, from Jesus, what does that mean? Well, let me just give you the Apostle Paul's statement about what that means. If it didn't come from Jesus, if it is not according to Jesus' doctrine, you know what the Apostle Paul says that that means? That means it is a doctrine of devils. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, somebody in, in the, in the two-states area here in Rockingham County or in Caswell County or in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania County or, or in Henry County, someone is teaching the doctrines of the devil. But I'm not going to tell you who. Well, how do I recognize them? Well, uh, Charles Stanley's going to tell me what the doctrine of the devil is. 
it is unscriptural. That's a doctrine of the devil. If it's not of Jesus, then, friends, it is the devil. If it comes from, from Jesus Christ, it's heavenly. If it comes from men, it is actually really originating from the one who is the arch enemy of Jesus and uses men, and that is the devil. Well, he'll tell you that it is unscriptural, but he won't tell you who's teaching it. Well, I will tell you. Because, you see, a predator who will damn your soul, and, and he, he is actually teaching you something that is not according to the faith. Well, I'll tell you who it is. It's the Methodist. It's the Presbyterian. It's the Episcopalian. It's the Catholic Church. All of these teach infant baptism, and it's not scriptural. I agree with, with Charles Stanley. But you know what, my friends? Now, uh, Tyler, let's put up our phone lines, and let's see if we get a little bit of feedback right here. Here's what I want to know. This is what I want to know. When I talk with persons of this stripe, Charles Stanley stripe, the Baptist, for instance, I hear them say that baptism isn't important anyway. It isn't essential. It is not essential. Well, if it's not essential, then why would you want to down the Methodists, the Presbyterian, the Episcopalians, and the Catholic over them teaching unscriptural baptism? When really, when you get down to it, baptism has nothing whatsoever to do with your salvation. Now, if you don't think that it has anything to do, if you think I'm stretching that, it doesn't have anything to do with your salvation, all you have to do is, is call up Brian Edwards over at the Blessed Hope Baptist Church over in Danville. He's a huge representative of the Baptist faith. Or you can get online and, and write up to Liberty University. They will tell you that baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. So why do you want to wrangle with the Methodists? You know what the Bible say? watching your show and um, my understanding is that uh, the Baptists do believe that it is a it is a commandment according to the scriptures to be baptized all right now you know one of the things you you help me with this sir one of the things that bothers me is I have a Baptist preacher that I can pull up right quick that actually will say it isn't essential to salvation now, when you say something is not essential to salvation, what does that mean? Could you, could you help me with that? Well, I would say when you say it's not essential, that uh, to go to heaven you don't have to be baptized. Okay. That, that's, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, that's, and, and that would mean that it's really not something you have to do to go to heaven. So, sir, you did a great job, if you ask me, of affirming my case. Right. Um, no, I guess... The way I'm looking at it, you know, uh, most bad, you know, I guess what's the, uh, you, you changed the word. At first you used a different word, then you said that it wasn't essential. What's that now? Well, well if it's not essential, then what, what is it? Uh, it's not important? Is it important? Is, now, now, sir, you help me here if I'm misrepresenting the Baptist. I'm going to try to represent them correctly. It's important to get into the Baptist church. You can't get into the Baptist church without being baptized. But you can get into heaven without being baptized. Now, am I correct on that? Uh, yeah, I guess that's the way they say okay. it. Okay. So it's actually harder to get into the Baptist church than it is to get into heaven. Well, I'm like I'm myself now. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I believe it as the Bible speaks. I don't, I'm not necessarily this doctrine that i mean this denomination that denomination okay but you know the um uh what you was just talking about um now what was you go back to what would you just say I, I said that in order to get into the baptist church you have to be baptized that's what the baptists say baptism is for right all right it's one of the reasons but you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven so right. i was saying that from their perspective, it's easier to go to heaven than it is to get into the Baptist church. Well, you know, Paul said, he said, uh, you know, he had wrote a le in one of the letters, and you probably know exactly where it's at. You know, Paul said, some some say uh, I am of Apollos, some say I am of a Paul of, of Paul. Okay. Paul said, but I am of Christ. Okay. And I think that's you know, people started following men. Well, you know what? I I'm really glad that you brought that up because.
Good evening, everybody. This is What Does the Bible Say? My name is Caleb Robertson. I am a Christian, and we always start out this broadcast by saying just these ideas to get you ready for the Bible conversation because it is going to be quite different. When I say I'm a Christian, I mean I am a Christian only. And because this broadcast is called What Does the Bible Say? I have my Bible with me. If you're watching in either the two-state area, we're broadcasting out of uh, Star News from Reedsville, North Carolina. We come back into Virginia, and then we also have a simulcast going on YouTube so anybody can watch anywhere at any time. We would ask you to have your Bible out. And really, people having, quote, Bible study where you don't have your book open is how everybody's getting into such trouble. They go around saying, well, my pastor said this, and my pastor said that, and I don't want y'all quoting me on anything. <laughs> Someone says, well, if you're teaching wrong, I'm sure you don't. No, it's not like that. It's not the idea where I say I don't think I have the right positions. I want you to study the text for yourself and become confident in your personal Bible study rather than always having to quote a man. So I hope you have your Bible ready to go open and notepad. We're going to go through Scripture and argumentation tonight. This is the name of the broadcast. You're watching What Does the Bible Say? It's brought to you by members of the body of Christ. We say concerned Christians. And this is my purpose. Tonight we're talking about Crosspoint Church. It's a community sect, seeker-friendly, basically. They used to be uh, something of the nature of a Southern Baptist, but now they just do all kinds of stuff, that whatever they want to do that's not biblical. But what I want to do is actually bring about more unity based on conformity to the New Testament text. Now, this is basically how it's going to be. It's going to be uncomfortable because a list of people, a number of people, are going to watch this broadcast tonight, and they're going to be finding out that their practices are not biblical. Why does that matter? Why do y'all down the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses so hard? You say, well, because they don't follow the Bible. They follow the Book of Mormon. You don't follow the Bible any more than they do at cross point. That's what I'm saying. So how are we going to actually have more unity? Well, what, what is it that's causing all of our division? Difference, basically, of conclusion on these matters. Women preachers, water baptism, how to worship, which church, see what I'm saying? So if we recognize those are our dividing points, then why can't we all come together and have the Bible study together and get some consensus going on this, the Bible, and then we be Christians only following the Bible only. It's not that difficult. Someone says, well, Caleb, it's a, it's a good idea and a wholesome plan, but I just don't think it will ever work. Uh, I think it will work with honest people who are actually trying. A lot of folk who watch this broadcast, uh, they're lazy. They don't want to actually study the 27 books of the New Testament. They would rather just be spoon-fed by their traditional pastor. Well, I can't make too much headway with a person like that. If you're local, and I'm saying I want to make headway, so I give out my personal contact info, 276-806-3641, 3641, if I said that correctly. And my email address is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. If you email me, we'll get you on the informer list, which is a page and a half Bible article that comes out every Sunday morning. We're doing a series that we call Striving for Mastery. You want to be the best that you can be. And there's nothing wrong with that. You start trying to be the best you can be, and someone calls you a Pharisee. Again, that person's probably just lazy and not even trying to better themselves. You try to better yourself regardless of what people are saying, and part of that is going to be your courage. Now, one more point. You're watching this on Star News? Fantastic. You're watching it in North Carolina or Virginia, but you say, my cousin Ted over in Wisconsin, he'd like this broadcast, but he can't see Star News. Well, he can watch What Does the Bible Say on YouTube, and any device that he has that can connect to YouTube, this is what it will look like. Purple white banner, that's my dad's picture, and then down here you get a watch live icon. We've got over a thousand videos on various topics. Playlist where some videos are put together and organized by topics, and so you can check all that out for free. Now, I want to say this as we get going. When people talk about the Church of Christ, I am not, and my brethren are not, using that idea as a sectarian title. So, and you'll hear me say this on the broadcast. I do not go for it when people call in and they're going to like have some commonality with me and they say, Caleb, I'm Church of Christ. I am not Church of Christ. I am a Christian and I am a member of the body of Christ. Now you might say, well, why does that matter? First Peter 4.11, we speak as the oracles of God. People not actually using biblical terms in biblical fashion is why everybody is confused. 
I am a member of the church of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I am a member, Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16. I'm a member of the family of God. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 12. I'm a member of the body of Christ. But here's my thing. I'm not in the Southern Baptist sect. I'm not in the Co-op Baptist sect. I'm not a Roman Papist. Roman sect is its own thing. I'm not a Presbyterian sectarian. I'm not an Episcopalian sectarian. We should not have these traditional dividers that a lot of y'all celebrate in. So this is what I say. When you think the Church of Christ, you ought to think these three passages and this idea. It is a collection of believers who value the Scripture over tradition. And here are these Scriptures. If you have your Bible, here they are tonight. Colossians 2.8, 1 Corinthians 4.6, and then Matthew 15.9. In Colossians 2.8, Paul says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. If we're being honest, y'all follow your particular southern, you know, southern religion traditions more than you do the Bible. And look at this. In 1 Corinthians 4.6, Paul says that you would learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. But you don't quote the Bible. You say, well, Caleb, my pastor told me I do not care what your pastor said. Your pastor is not an apostle. Obviously, your pastor is not Jesus. Someone says, well, Caleb, you're not an apostle, and I'm not trying to get you to take my word either, am I? I'm giving you what the apostles wrote in, in the Bible, and it's the same as your Bible. And then over here in first, uh, Matthew 15, 9, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Look, someone says, well, Caleb, I'm sure you have traditions, and I've said this before. I'm trying my hardest to decipher what is tradition versus what is actually in the New Testament text. And if it's something that contradicts New Testament text, I want to get rid of it. If it is something that basically Galatians 5.1 inhibits liberty, let's get rid of it. Because that is the idea, to be free in Christ. And so, no, I don't want a whole bunch of man's tradition, and I'm trying to get you to see that that is actually what you're doing in your particular sect, whether it's Cross Point or Hillcrest Baptist Church. So we're doing this again, and... You know, this is Mr. Randy Aldridge. His name is definitely Randy. So Randy and then Carl Keith. And so this is how we got where we are. Randy over at Hillcrest Baptist, which is a Southern Baptist affiliate, they poured water on this woman and they called it baptism. Not only is that not scriptural, that's not even in line with the Southern Baptist faith and message. So then about two weeks after this happened, we find where Cross Point Church, Cross Point Sect in the Ridgeway area, they had a baptismal Sunday, and they hadn't had a baptismal Sunday in two years out of Carl Keith's own mouth. And so I asked the question, was this a response from Cross Point directed at Hillcrest? Was it a passive, aggressive rebuke? And so an odd thing happened. Uh, Carl Keith did a little bit of complaining that we were using their footage that they had open for the world on Facebook. Anybody could have found it and done anything with it. But one thing was said to me, he complained, and someone said, what would he complain about? Giving him props for rebuking the Southern Baptist Church? Because all of these were done by immersion. They just aren't teaching the truth. This is a very strange thing, having Bible study. Because you basically say, is this a response? Are y'all actually giving out a rebuke? And then they start complaining when I basically say, at least you're trying to stand on something. Very strange. People take Bible study very personally, and that's what I want to start out with tonight. A note to Carl Keith. <sighs> saying it, I know, doesn't really do anything for a lot of people, but I'm saying honestly to you, none of this is personal. And I've said this before, Carl has a family, John 3.16, it's like, look, y'all, God loves Carl. I love Carl. Someone said, you don't love Carl. Look, I have general good wishes and concern for Carl. I don't want bad things to happen with him. Are you asking me, do I want to go camping with him? I don't know him well enough to say, oh, I'd like to go camping with him. I want him to be a saved Christian. None of this is personal. And I'll say this, too, for Carl Keith, like in his time in the community, Carl has, and I, you know, someone says, how dare you just call him by his first name? Come on now. He has had a hard time. 
And what I mean is Tim Whitehart left Carl holding the bag over at Freedom Baptist, and Freedom Baptist never recovered from Tim Whitehart. So basically you got Carl's holding the bag, and Larry Luffman is just like, you know, third string to Tim Whitehart. I, and just how it is. I don't mean it in any type of way, but I think it's a lot of sectarian competition. So I recognize that. Tim Whitehart commits adultery, totally leaves the area, goes down to Florida, and it's like, okay, Carl, you're up to bat. That's really awful. And then someone says to me, number two, uh, Carl is a man and Carl is human. I understand that, and I feel for Carl, but I do want to say this. I'm not asking Carl to, like, quit, pack up, and leave town. I just want Carl to repent and start teaching the truth. And someone says, well, who cares what you want? John 17, verse number 20 and 21, Jesus wants all of us together that they all may be one. Now, do you think that God in heaven is fine with all of our religious division? You say, well, Caleb, you just said John 17, 20, 21. Of course, he's not fine with it. Okay, so what are you doing to fix it? So basically what Carl Keith is doing is just taking people who are coming from different sects and they're joining his sect because half the people gave testimony they had already been immersed in water before. And Tim Hunt down at Rich Acres would say, you know, that's not doing anything. Now, here's my question to all of y'all. Is it not ridiculous for Carl to be teaching everybody the way that he does, but nobody can teach him? Is he infallible? No, and he wouldn't claim to be infallible. And someone says, well, Caleb, who can teach you? Uh, hello, this broadcast offers open phone lines. Carl Keith could call in. Uh, they have another pastor named Tyler. I'm just newly acquainted with Tyler. Never met him personally, but that's why I said acquainted. Uh, Tyler could participate in dialogue. He looks like he's my age. And then I say this back to everybody at point number four. Does it not matter that Carl Keith is knowingly teaching error to people? And someone might say, well, how do you know that he knows he's teaching error? Because he has come in contact with gospel preachers for a number of years. He absolutely knows what the New Testament teaches as compared to what Baptist tradition would be. He has seen my dad, Johnny Robertson, debate enough Baptist preachers, and he obviously watches what does the Bible say because he complained about it to Star News. None of this is personal. I hope he really teaches the truth. I just hope he would stop promoting tradition and confusing everybody. Now, someone says, Caleb, you claim that he knows he's not teaching the truth, and you claim that he's confusing everybody. Here is my statement. None of this is personal, y'all. We got to get down to the truth. Either I don't know how to work Facebook and I just cannot find the video, or Crosspoint took this video down. And I'm not saying this about his public speaking ability. I am saying this is one of the worst presentations on water baptism I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them. And for me, as I watch this, I have to ask the question, did he make such a mess because in the back of his mind he said, the Christians are going to get a hold of this video and they're going to make a public example out of it. Now, let, some of y'all got to start studying your Bibles because someone says, who are you to make a public example out of it? So this is in your Bible, just like it's in mine. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke. I've got a mandate. And if y'all really thought I was teaching the truth and you could actually answer what I present, then your preacher would have bought airtime. And at least for a month, like run a month special, we're going to answer Caleb Robertson. We're going to answer the members of the Church of Christ. But you don't do it. And when you do put up videos, you end up taking them down. So here's what I'm saying. We're going to go through this very brief sermon that he gave, but I just want you to see these points on the front end. And you tell me, is this somebody who's comfortable with the information that he's presenting? Give a listen. With Jesus Christ, and then he says, be baptized. And when you look through the book of Acts, the word baptizo is the Greek word that is used for baptism. Now, originally, baptizo was used, uh, this is way B.C., before Christ. It was used to, to identify, like, sunken ship. A sunken ship was a baptizo. And then about 200 years before Jesus, the word baptizo started being used in the Jewish um, 
religion. In other words, that was part of what you had to do to become a Jew. Now, for those of you reading the Bible with us, you know, the Israelites, the Jews, God's chosen people, the Messiah is going to come through them. But what's going to happen here is as... Uh, I lost train of thought now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, what was I saying? Who was listening? Baptisms, there you go. It started coming in 200 years ago. Baptisms, there you go. It started coming in 200 years ago, yeah. 200 years... <laughs> 200 years before Jesus came in, and, and there were certain things that you had to do. Let's say, for instance, if you were a Jew, it was not only now just good enough to be a Jew, because Jesus comes to this earth, then we sin. So in other words, God says, go and get the people to start baptizing. And the Jordan River during this time, there were, it was a place where so many people were coming in and out because of the water source, and there were so many advantages there. And so... He starts baptizing people for the repentance of sin. In other words, when you got baptized, it was kind of washing away and, and saying you're going to live a new life for God. And so the people that were living in sin, that's what they were doing. But now Jesus is going to come on the scene. John the Baptist is in the Jordan River baptizing, and Jesus comes up to him, and John the Baptist knows exactly who Jesus is. And so when he walks up to John the Baptist, he says, baptize me, John. And, Jesus, and John says, no, you baptize me. And he said, no, this must be done. And so then John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Why did he need to be baptized? Maybe that's what you're thinking. He had no sin. He was perfect. But now he's going to live an example of being symbolic of, of the, what it represented which, the, for um, washing away of the sins. And so living a new life and living in a different way. And so anyway, Jesus gets baptized. Uh, the Bible says that when he did, and John raised him up out of the water, uh, God said from heaven, said, this is my son who I am very well pleased. And so then he starts his ministry. So now Jesus is 30 years old. He's going to die at 33. Now baptism is coming to a way where it's going to lead up to Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, and then you uh, follow Jesus in baptism, or identify Jesus in baptism. So... With that being said, all that baptism came in whenever Jesus got baptized, and then now they're moving forward, and uh, even after that, and uh, now he says, go and baptize other people. In other words, teach them what I have taught you, and that was in Matthew, teach them what I have taught you, and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So one of the biggest reasons for baptism... What he's doing is he's giving Jesus everybody Christ. four points. He said these are four things because he wanted to keep it short and simple. And he said these are four things that you need to know on water baptism. We're going to go back and we're going to get the first two, but I want you to see how he treats numbers three and four. And baptism, and baptism happens after Jesus, after we accept Jesus. So baptism is all about obedience. I'm just going to run through these last two real quick. Uh, number three, baptism comes after salvation. I just talked about that. Number four, it's also when you get baptized, it's a type of, um, it, it's a powerful reminder because uh, it reminds you that, hey, when I got baptized, you know, I, I let people know that I'm not living my old self anymore. I'm living for the Lord. And that's a huge step for you. And if you want to get victory in your life, you really need to be willing to take your next step in baptism or whatever your next step is. Whatever that may be. All right, as the band comes out, That's my question, y'all. For those of you who would tell me, Caleb, I grew up going to Sunday school. Have you ever seen a preacher come out and say, y'all, I got four points today and just totally dump the final two? I have never seen that. Now, I'll tell you, someone says, well, Caleb, you're just having a bad day. Maybe, but I'm just telling you the coincidence that he is trying to promote the non-essential idea of water baptism according to salvation or pertaining to salvation, he is just promoting so many unbiblical ideas that he's just walking over himself all over the place. And then when he gets to points to three and four, he says, I'm just going to give these to y'all and the band's going to come up. And I'm telling you, listen to this. Imitation, I'm going to pray and they're going to sing one more song here in just a few minutes. But uh, let's all bow your heads and close your eyes real he's quick. He's having a with all the scripture, so where he finally gets comfortable is when he can just start making stuff up.
He's going to get everybody in the room to bow their heads, close their eyes, and then he's just going to start rambling. But there's not going to be any Bible in that. And therefore, if there's no Bible, you don't have to worry about contradictions, which are filled, or his lesson is filled with these contradictions. So what we're going to do now, look, y'all, here we go back to this. It's not personal, but we're going to go through this, and I'm going to start out, number one, by saying what he did get right, okay? You're a member over at Crosspoint. You need to hear this lesson because Carl has been teaching you error. False doctrine. He's not giving you the Bible. He's just giving you Southern sectarian tradition. I know that y'all aren't SBC. But that's what you're getting is just man-made ideas. So let's do this. From the beginning, here's Carl Keith, and we're just going to go through this tonight. Uh, it's going to be that easy. A few minutes, and I want to kind of explain what baptism really is. Um, because a lot of times, you know, it depends on what kind of background you come from. Uh, you know, it can be different things. But Jesus, baptism really is. Um, because a lot of times, you know, it depends on what kind of background you come from. Uh, um, because a lot of times, you know, it depends on what now, kind of background right off the you bat, come y'all, I'm, I'm giving it to him. What he said is absolutely Correct. Now, don't give me the stuff about, Caleb, you're so haughty to tell us that you're just going to explain it. Well, that's what Carl said he's going to do. Let me give you some explanation on water baptism. And the first thing he said was, it is a difficult conversation depending on people's background. So, if I say water baptism to a Roman sectarian, a Roman papist, what are they going to think? They're going to think, oh, we're going to splash our baby in a bowl, right? You've seen some of these priests, these Roman priests, they get the baby in the pits, thr thrust them through a bowl, bring them out. And you say, well, they didn't thrust my baby through a bowl. They just poured water on them. Fine, what have you. Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans, and Methodists. If we say water baptism to those people because of their sectarian background, Carl Keith is right. He said they're going to think one particular thing. If I say water baptism to uh, a Pentecostal or an apostolic, all they're going to be thinking about is, oh, great, you've been baptized. Now you can start speaking in tongues after we teach you how to do it. To an apostolic or a Pentecostal, being baptized is not nearly as important as the idea of speaking in tongues, which they cannot do. And then for Carl and his background, because he did, he was the preacher for Freedom Baptist sect, so he has Baptist roots. When you talk about water baptism to a person of Baptist background, they always think that same tagline that's not in the Bible, outward sign of an inward grace. You know, the Bible does not teach that in the New Testament. The Bible does not say that you're baptized to display an outward sign of an inward grace. And you say, yes, it does. Call me tonight while I'm live and give me the scripture that says water baptism is your outward sign of an inward grace. Carl Keith is absolutely right that it is such a difficult conversation because everybody is bringing baggage to the conversation. Everybody's bringing their background, their tradition. Well, how do we get past everyone's background and their baggage to have the conversation? Everybody has to get the same book out. But when I'm talking to Southern Baptists, they're going to bring the Baptist faith and message. When I'm talking to a co-op, they're going to bring out their documents, co-op Baptists. When I talk to an independent fundamental Baptist, they're probably going to bring out John Rice, Peter Ruckman or Hiles, what's his name, Hiles Anderson up in Indiana. Everybody's got somebody they're going to bring to the table. I am going to bring my New Testament. Your Methodist neighbor is going to bring their discipline. The Episcopalians are going to bring the Common Book of Prayer, and the Presbyterians are going to bring the Westminster Confession. Look, that's your background. The only way to fix our division is for us all to start studying the New Testament, and Carl Keith is not teaching from the New Testament. He's giving you all absolutely Baptist tradition. Now, here's the idea, John 12, 34. This is the way you operate. And you got to be realistic here, y'all. You, you have to be honest, and I'm trying to be honest. When Jesus was teaching, John 12, 32, he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And then the next verse says he spoke this, signifying what manner of death. And the people answered him, and they said, we have heard out of the law that Christ abides forever. How sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Y'all operate in this same idea here. Well, we always heard. And you know, they might actually get to say we at least heard it out of the law. 
but then they don't have the understanding, right? They think that it's all about physical death and it's just not. Well, that's what you say. Well, I'm, Caleb, I've always heard. That's not good enough. You have to become a Bible student in your own right. I am not saying that you have to go get a bachelor's degree, a master's, or a PhD. I think that religious degrees are absolute junk. You don't need that. What you need to do is start studying your New Testament. Can I give you an idea of how to actually go through a, a solid reading of your Bible? What the, one of the best things that you could do for yourself, and it's a lot. You're going to stop being lazy if you want to be a good Bible student. You ought to read the book of Matthew all the way through. And when you get done with that, you should read the book of Acts all the way through. When you get done with that, you should read Mark all the way through. When you get done with that, you should read Acts all the way through. When you get done with that, you should go back and read Luke all the way through, then read Acts all the way through. When you get done with that, read John all the way through, and then read Acts again. You say, well, when am I going to do the epistles? The book of Acts is getting you ready for the epistles. Acts 16 is Philippi, the Philippian epistle. Acts 17, Thessalonian epistle. He's in Thessalonica. Acts 18 is Corinth. That gets you ready for the Corinthian letters. Ephesians is Acts chapter 19. See, y'all don't know that because, like I said, it takes time and effort, but y'all are so accustomed to letting all your pastors spoon-feed you Baptist tradition or whatever your sectarian tradition might be. So here's another thing that I would encourage. This is not a creed book. This is not a doctrinal book. This is the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, and you could do a study. Go to the, It's a dictionary. You go to the B section and find baptized, baptized, baptism, and you do your own study, and you tell me what you come away with as you study your New Testament for yourself. Now, here's one more. When you're in Luke 10, 25, and 28, this is what Jesus says to this lawyer. A certain lawyer stood up, tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit life? And Jesus' response was, What is written in the law, and how readest thou? Now, here's what someone's going to say. Previous slide. Someone's going to say, Caleb, it is impossible to have Bible conversation without bringing tradition to the table. And then you say this, it is impossible to have Bible conversation where you're just not comparing just opinions. Because Jesus did say, how read a sound? You say, that's his opinion. Well, here's my statement back to that. Verse number 28, when the man answered in verse 27, you love God and you love your neighbor. Jesus said back, you have answered correctly. <sighs> you're right. It is impossible to come to the discussion without bringing tradition. That does not mean that it is impossible for you to throw off your tradition. You say it's impossible to come to the table without already having opinions. You're right, but that does not mean that it is impossible for you and I to wade through opinions and find the actual truth and agree on it, just like Jesus and this lawyer did. So I have real honest belief and confidence in you. I think that God gave you a good brain, and I also think that he gave us a book that Mark 12, 37 says, the common man heard him gladly. You don't have to go to seminary, and all these pastors who did go to seminary, it did not help them one bit. I'm just going to give you an example. When uh, Matt Dodrick was over at First Baptist on Starling, I attended one of his uh, discussions on apocalyptic literature, and I was having to help him finish his class. Didn't know the words, didn't know the ideas, and I was consistently having to say, uh, this is the word you're looking for, and at some point he stopped and said, did you go to seminary? I'm wondering if you did. Now, let's do this. He's going to go on and he's going to give some more dialogue and I want to give it an honest representation. Uh, you know, it can be different things, but Jesus created Christianity, you know, when he got saved, or when he get, we died on the cross and, and get, uh, God raised him from the dead, now we can be saved of our sin. And really Christianity is Jesus. It's just following him. Are you going to be perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect, but we're finding our path. And so here in this whole situation, I think sometimes we as uh, Christians, sometimes we can just make things a lot more complicated than they really are. Uh, sometimes we can just, you know, it's like his great event happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus gave his life and then God raised him from the dead. And now it's taken the church 2,000 years just to really mess everything up. But anyway, complicated, you know, and we start adding and adding and adding. But really, Thank when Jesus that, right? first started, he, he wanted people to follow him. The Bible was weird, but Jesus commanded the disciples in Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20. It's called the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is pretty much, well, we'll go ahead and read this if you want to put that on the screen for me. Uh, the Great Commission 
then the Bible says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is claiming that I've got all the power. Now, then he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. I'm telling you, I am a Bible student, okay? I'm not saying like I'm this genius Bible scholar, but I'm saying I know enough to know how the end of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John mix together. And I'm telling you now, it's not a coincidence that when Carl Keith says, I'm giving you four points tonight on water baptism, and I'm going to explain water baptism to you all, that he goes to Matthew 28. <laughs> Do I disagree with Matthew 28? No, I love Matthew 28. It's the truth. But there is a reason, y'all, that in his lesson, I'm saying in the entirety of his lesson, he does not give you all Mark 16, 16. Because it's not going to mix with one of his final points where he's going to say, you're saved. And then later on, you be baptized whenever you get the chance. That is not what the Bible teaches. And I'm saying, y'all, you don't know any better. Excuse me. You don't know any better as you're just sitting in the pew at Cross Point. That's just the way that it is. You, if you be honest, you say, I, Caleb, I have not been studying my Bible as I ought to for a number of years. Okay, you don't know any better. You're sitting in the pew, and Carl Keith just gives you Matthew 28, 19 by itself. Go and baptize all nations. Why? Mark 16, 16 says, so that they might be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. How is a person going to be damned? They don't believe. How is a person going to be saved? They have to believe and be baptized, Mark 16, 16. When he said this is the Great Commission, that is often what it's called, but this is Mark's account of the Great Commission. And you can find it, the same thing, in Luke chapter 24. You're not going to find it in John. But why is it that he only gave you one when he's really trying to cement water baptism? He's, I'm going to explain water baptism to y'all, but he doesn't give you Mark 16, 16. Now, you should be at home writing this down and go ask Carl, Carl, why did you not tell us about Mark 16, 16 that says a person is saved after they've been baptized? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism comes after, or let me pause a second. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Salvation comes after water baptism. Now, he very well may say to you that Mark 16, 16 is not really in the Bible. Can you imagine you go to your pastor and you say, can you help me understand the Bible? And he basically just says, well, really, the Bible you're carrying is not accurate. <laughs> well, that's what the Mormons do. You, you guys don't actually have the full picture. That's not a very good answer. Now, let's go on to this and let's get forward a little bit. We're going into, we're just going one minute from 240 to 340. Here's point number one about water baptism per Carl Keith. Great. They said, but not in a service. We just want you to come and we'll do it right here. Just... And I'm not trying to confuse anybody or do anything. I'm just trying to keep it simple. Um, but this is what the Bible says. Number one, baptism is all about going public. Baptism is about going public. I remember one time uh, early in my ministry, oh, gosh, before I started Cross Point, uh, early in my ministry, I had a family with four hmm, teenage kids maybe and they wanted to get baptized and I said great they said but not in a service we just want you to come and we'll do it right here just just us and I thought you're missing the purpose you see we are to come in faith with Jesus Christ and then he says be baptized and when you look through the book of Acts the word baptizo is the Greek word Jesus Christ and then he says be baptized they said but not in a service we just want you to come and we'll do it right here just just us and I thought no, you're missing the purpose he tells these people, you're missing the purpose. Now, it's probably going to come up in the slides in a minute, but if he is going to go out of his way and tell people, you are not understanding the purpose of water baptism, then you can't be mad at me for saying, no, he still is not teaching the purpose of water baptism. He says, number one, baptism is about going public. And as I said before, that is that Baptist tradition of outward sign, inward grace. And that's wrong. Number one, you don't have a scripture for that. You have to have some authoritative passage that tells me that I'm being baptized to communicate to everybody else that I'm now a follower of Jesus. And here's my question back to you all at Crosspoint, because this is what Carl taught you. So this is what you're thinking is the correct idea. I'm asking you this question. In Acts 8.31, who's there? The Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. Philip asked the eunuch, can you understand what you're reading? 
And the eunuch says back, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him in the chariot. So you got two individuals. And you might have one chariot driver, what have you, but I know there are two people here. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. According to y'all's incorrect idea, why did Philip not tell him, Well, I understand you want to be baptized. But let's wait two years like they did at Crosspoint. Let's wait two years to where we can get some people together and have a baptismal Sunday because we want to tell other folk that you've already been saved and now you are following Jesus. And you might say, well, Caleb, you don't know who all's there. You don't know that it's not just two people. But what I do know is they did not wait to draw a crowd. You have this idea that I'm being baptized to make a public statement. No, you're not. I don't know what Romans 10, 9 and 10, confess with your mouth. Why is that not your public statement? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, risen from the dead. I, I believe that. Why is that not your statement? And then you actually do this for the purpose of why Jesus commanded it. Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now here's another one. And you really, you know, don't just let me do a broadcast and I don't hear from any of you. You're at cross point. You say, Carl's teaching the truth, and I'm asking you these questions. If it's all about going public, why do they not wait to draw a crowd? Who do you have in this picture? Paul is not saved on the road to Damascus. That's Baptist tradition, but it's not what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 9, about verses number 5 and 6, Jesus tells him, Go into the city and wait, and you'll be told what you must do. So here's what we have in Acts 9, 17 and 18. Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me, that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, arose and was baptized. You say, well, Caleb, you don't know how many people were there. Well, I see the word immediately, so I know he's not waiting two years like Crosspoint did to have a, quote, baptismal Sunday. What I can clearly see in the text is there's Ananias and there's Saul, and Saul is baptized of Ananias immediately. Now, you, it's fine, good, good, you're paying attention. Somebody says, well, Caleb, we got you because he called him Brother Saul, and he can't be a brother unless he's already saved on the road to Damascus. Okay, here's Acts 22, 22 16. This is still Ananias talking to Paul. He says, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized? Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If Paul was saved on the road to Damascus and he's waiting to hear from this man Ananias, and when Ananias shows up, why, if he was already saved, if Paul was already saved, why would Ananias say to him, Wash away your sins? Why did Paul not say, Now, wait a second. <laughs> My sins were taken away back on the road. I'm just here so you can make a public declaration to everybody else that I'm now a Christ follower. You have responsibility to straighten this out. And in all honesty, Carl Keith has responsibility. He's y'all's pastor, right? And I know you say, well, Carl's a good dude and we like Carl. Great. Keep on liking Carl. I like Carl. That's fine. Carl needs to change his doctrine to be in line with the truth, and y'all do too. Look, you say, well, we got a nice building over here. Fantastic. Keep your building. This is not about the fact that y'all assemble in another building. It's that Carl is openly teaching people false doctrine. Now, here it is. Why can I not say that you're missing the point when Carl said y'all are missing the point? Here is the point. With Mark 16, 16 and Acts 2, 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That is clearly stated in the scriptures, and Carl just totally ignores it. I didn't hear him mention Acts 2.38 in his Let Me Explain Baptism sermon, where he said, we're not ashamed, and then I guess they took it down, or I'm just an idiot and I can't find it. Now, let's go back over here. Keep listening. We'll go just a little bit further ahead. A sunken ship was a baptizo. And then about 200 years before Jesus, see, before Christ, it was used to, to identify like sunken ship. A sunken ship was a baptism. Yeah, Pastor Carl, he knows Greek. It's not anything to know the word baptizo. Okay, and the way that he's going to be talking about it is incorrect. He's going to start getting into Judaism and the word baptizo. Totally incorrect. So don't, look, this is a, a gimmick and a trick, y'all. 
You say, well, Caleb, are you a Greek student? No, I'm not like this Greek scholar. I've got an interlinear. I have Kittle's uh, New Testament dictionary, and I can do all the Englishman's. I've got the books. Am I the Greek scholar? No. All he's doing is taking a moment where everybody says, oh, man, he knows Greek. And then about 200 years before Jesus, and then about 200 years before Jesus the word baptizo started being used in the Jewish um, religion. In other words, that was part of what you had to do to become a Jew. Now, for those of you reading the Bible with us, you know, the Israelites, the Jews, God's chosen people, the Messiah is going to come through them. But what's going to happen here is as, uh, I lost train of thought now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, what was I saying? Who was listening? <laughs> Baptisms, there you go. It started coming in 200 years ago, yeah. 200 years... <laughs> 200 years before Jesus came in, and, and there were certain things that you had to do. Let's say, for instance, if you were a Jew, it was not only now just good enough to be a Jew, because now they were starting to let non-Jews become part of their, their, their religion. But in order for them to do that, there were certain things they had to do, and bat baptism uh, was a spiritual part of that. I encouraged you as we got going to get your Bible out. I have a Bible program. I've got Bibles built into a PowerPoint slide. Why do y'all let y'all's pastors get up without a Bible in hand and just ramble on? And how is it that none of y'all in the audience, like, are y'all grown-ups? Are, are you like a sound, accountable mind that you are not going to call this stuff out? That he can talk to y'all for 20 minutes with, like, no Bible authority? You do not have in the New Testament Jews telling non-Jews to be baptized in order to be a part of the Hebrew nation. What do you have? You have in Matthew 23, 15 where it says they would travel compass, sea, and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you made him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Look at Acts 11, verses 1 through 3. What's the issue to a Jew? Circumcision. In Acts 11, after Peter goes into the house of Cornelius, the apostles and the brethren were in Judea, heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were with the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them? Jews don't care about water baptism. Jews care about circumcision. Now, why was Carl Keith having such a hard time in that moment? Because he basically made an excursion where he wanted to impress y'all with the word baptizo, and he made a mess of it. Jew, Jews don't appeal to baptizo. Now you can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and just because they wash and clean themselves for a feast day, an annual feast day, is not them telling non-Jews, hey, you need to be baptized. Jews clean up for Passover, Deuteronomy 9. Now you might be saying, Caleb, what difference does it make? This lends to your confusion. So now here's my thing, y'all. This lends to your confusion. I'm trying to talk to you about on the street. We meet out in public. And I'm trying to talk to you about water baptism. And you say, well, Caleb, my pastor said that water baptism just was a Jewish custom. Carl is wrong. Anybody else who's trying to tell you that 200 years before Jesus that the Jews were making people be baptized, baptizo, before John? Where's he getting that? Just put a scripture up here. Jews care about circumcision. <laughs> Why? Circumcision puts you back in Genesis chapter 17 connected to Abraham. What does baptism before John or Jesus have to do with Abraham to any of these Jews? Look at Acts 15. Acts 15, we are deep into the book of Acts, right? We are years away from Jesus being crucified. And still, what's happening here? Peter has baptized folk, Paul is baptizing folk, and you get to Acts 15, and what are the Jews still on? Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the man of Moses, you cannot be saved. All Carl is doing is confusing you so that when you come in contact with a real Christian who presents Acts 2.38 or Mark 16.16 16 or Acts 22.16, Mark, or what's his name, Carl, is getting you primed to say, oh, no, 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 200 years before Jesus, they had a tradition where Jews were baptizing non-Jews. Where's the scripture? Because y'all let Carl get up there and present zero scripture to you on that. Now, let's let it play just a little bit longer. And then when Jesus comes to this earth, then we see John the Baptist, 
And the Bible says that God, let's see if I got that verse. God said that uh, he went to John, the Bible says he, Luke 2 and verses 3, 2 and 3. I'm all over the place. He knows he's in hot water. Pun. <laughs> this is a baptism discussion, he's in hot water. I said, have you ever seen somebody such a mess? And it's about to get a whole lot worse with what he's going to say about John's baptism. Now give a listen, y'all. Luke 3, 2 and 3. Luke 3, 2 and 3. John the Baptist comes on the scene. The Bible says during the high priesthood of Annas and, and uh, Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So in other words, God says, go and get the people to start baptizing. And the Jordan River during this time, there were, it was a place where so many people were coming in and out because of the water source. And there were so many advantages there. You were a person there. who followed the Bible... It is super easy to describe and explain why we are at the Jordan River because there's much water there. You don't have to start building a case about like what? The Jews had like seven highways and they all seem to interpass through the Jordan. Just stick with what the Bible says, John 3, 23. There's much water over there. And so, and so he starts baptizing people for the repentance of sin. In other words, when you got baptized, it was kind of washing away and, and saying you're going to live a new life for God. And so the people that were living in sin, that's what they were doing. But now Jesus is the scene. John the Baptist is in the Jordan River. In other words, when you get, God says go and get the people to start baptizing. And the Jordan River during this time, there were, it was a place where so many people were coming in and out because of the water source. And there were so many advantages there. And so he starts baptizing people for the repentance of sin. In other words, when you got baptized, it was kind of washing away and, and saying you're going to live a new life for Carl God. Carl just killed himself big time. That's the same Greek word that's going to be in Acts 2.38 for the remission of sin. So if you are being baptized in the baptism of John, he said, let's get it out of his own mouth. When you got baptized, it was kind of washing away and, and saying you're going to live a new repentance of sin. In other words, when you got baptized, it was kind of washing away. So I don't know what kind of washing away is, but I know that in Luke 3 it says, He came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then Carl Key says, It's kind of washing away. And so my question to everybody from Crosspoint right now is that if Luke 3, verse number 3, which is also found in Mark chapter 1, verse number 4, if John's baptism, according to Carl Keith, was kind of washing away sin, then why is Acts 2.38 the same word? Where is it? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Why is this one not kind of washing away your sins too? Absolutely, that's what it was for when John was doing it. And this is what he said in Acts 2.38, for the remission of sins. Look, if it means, if four means that in Luke 3, it means in Acts 2.38. And I'm saying, y'all, he has no clue what to do with John's baptism. And someone says, that's really insulting to his intelligence. No, it's insulting to his studiousness, and I am fine to insult that because he apparently has not, and I'm saying, y'all, for years Carl Keith has been in this community and he has not tightened up his argumentation any better than this. This is awful. Like, this is, you know, whatever Sunday y'all said, we're going to let the preteens lead worship. And the preteen did the sermon. And, and you say, Caleb, that's just really demeaning and discouraging. I tell you what's discouraging is the fact that adults sit in that audience and you don't demand any better. Hey, Pastor Carl, you want to open your Bible? I would be super insulted to go and sit and hear somebody not be that organized or so unorganized and just think, we're paying for this. Y'all paid for that, right? It, that's discouraging. Now, he continues. And you're going to live a new life for God. And so the people that were living in sin, that's what they were doing. But now Jesus is going to come on the scene. John the Baptist is in the Jordan River baptizing, and Jesus comes up to him, and John the Baptist knows exactly who Jesus is. And so when he walks up to John the Baptist, he says, baptize me, John. Jesus, and John says, no, you baptize me. And he said, no, this must be done. 
And so then John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Why did he need to be baptized? Maybe that's what you're thinking. He had no sin. He was perfect. But now he's going to live an example of being symbolic of, of the, what it represented which, uh, the, for um, washing away of the sins. And so live an of of the, what it represented which, uh, the, for um, washing the away of the here? sins. <laughs> when you get to Acts 2.38, we're going to say, this has nothing to do with the forgiveness of sins. So you take a man, Jesus, and you say, well, he has no sin, but he's going to symbolize the forgiveness and washing away of sins just so that you can get to Acts 2.38 and say, this has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins. This is Baptist tradition. This is what you get when you don't have your Bible out. Do you have your Bible out tonight? I'm sure I've already said this. Look, someone says, well, this is just, it's not personal. And I love you enough to give you the truth that Carl won't give you. What do you think I'm going to get out of this? Someone says, well, you're like expecting all these people to send you money. What? Where, where, where did you get that idea? We never ask for a love offering. Do you know how many times they pass a plate? That's all sectarian groups think about is tithes, free will offering, Mother's Day, Easter, Pastor Appreciation Day. I'm just giving you scripture and some of y'all can't handle it. Now, listen to this. And so living a new life. And so living a new life. He was perfect, but now he's going to live an example of being symbolic of, of the, what it represented which, uh, the, for um, washing away of the sins. And so living a new life and living in a different way. And so anyway, Jesus gets baptized and living in a different way. Differently than when he, before, before he was baptized. Y'all, you, know, you are not Jesus. Why do y'all all take this idea? Well, why was Jesus baptized? You're not Jesus. <laughs> In no sense. And I'm not either, but I'm not making this argument. I would be appealing to this, be baptized like Paul in Acts 22, 16, because you are not Jesus. You say, well, Jesus had no sin. Do you have sin? Well, yes, I do. Okay, then you're out of that. Wash away thy sins, Acts 22, 16. Now, why tell thou, rise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Uh, I don't know why... You would not just do this. I'm going to be baptized like Saul, Paul. I'm going to be baptized like the people in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to be baptized like the people in Acts chapter 8. They heard the things concerning Jesus and the kingdom of God, and they were baptized by Philip. You're not Jesus. So what he's doing is giving you classic Baptist smokescreen. I present Acts 22:16 and Acts 2:38, Mark 16, 16, and Baptist preacher Carl. And every other Baptist preacher, they give you, they say, oh, toss out Jesus to him. Say, well, why did Jesus be baptized? You're not Jesus. Boy, we took care of that real easy. Let's go a little bit more. And so anyway, Jesus gets, and so anyway, Jesus gets baptized. Uh, the Bible says that when he did, and John raised him up out of the water, uh, God said from heaven, said, this is my son who I am very well pleased. And so then he starts his ministry. So now Jesus is 30 years old. He's going to die at 33. Now baptism is coming to a way where it's going to lead up to Jesus and the forgiveness of sins. Just and said, Jesus begins his ministry and now baptism leads to the remission of sins. Why did they take this video down? You tell me. The whole theme is I'm not ashamed. And you tell me, have you ever seen somebody stumble over themselves as much as he's doing in this, in this sermon? And I say, my thought as I watched it for the first time was he had to know we were going to get this. Now it's gone. I already had it saved, and he just told everybody. Now baptism is coming to a way. Now baptism is coming to a way where it's going to lead up to Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, and then you uh, follow Jesus in baptism, or identify Jesus in baptism. So, with that being said, all that baptism came in whenever Jesus John got baptized. And then now they're moving forward. Now they're moving forward, and uh, even after that. And uh, now, the second thing is this. Baptism is all about this being obedient. a whole other one that we're not going to spend too much time on. He says baptism is about being obedient. So what happens when a person says, I'm already saved, Carl. I don't need to be baptized. What are you going to do? You're going to tell him, well, you can't just reject it. And he's going to say back to you, well, why not? Once saved, always saved. I'm telling you I'm saved by faith alone, grace alone, belief alone, three alone. And I don't need to be baptized. Carl now has you in a situation where either you're going to be baptized or you are going to die 
being a saved person while saying, I am openly disobeying God. It's about being obedient. It's about being obedient. In other words... God, when we're obedient, he's our heavenly father. And so, God, when we're obedient, that he's our heavenly like father. like John 3, 5. When does he become my heavenly father? When I obey him by being born again. He just created this whole new thing that we're not going to get into, but I am going to close out with this tonight, y'all. <laughs> okay, let's look at this. And so, this is the order. You get and so, this is the order. You get saved through belief in Jesus Christ and that God raised him from the dead, it's by, uh, it's by faith only, not by our works. And then, and then to be baptized. That's your next step. And then after baptism, we're real big on next steps here. What is your next step? And so I knew when we did, this is the first time we've done it since COVID, so I, I figured we'd have more than what we had with all the salvations that we've had. James, if you're in the, it's so neat when people type in the chat, I gave my life to Jesus. We love to see yeah, that. Never tell that total to demeanor you, change here. He is comfortable. Why? Because he's getting his pants off. Don't do that. Down your head. It's not Bible anymore, so he's comfortable. But listen to what he what he says. Here in this building, our theme for baptism is "I am not ashamed." If you're in this building and you just said yes to Jesus for the first time, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Can we just celebrate with you? We just want to rejoice with you. I'm not going to call you up Remember here. There's your promise. Some people said we like to be baptized, but not in front of everybody. He said, oh, no, you're missing the point. You need to be having a public statement. You should not be ashamed. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I'm not going to call you up on stage and embarrass you. This video, which you cannot find anymore, or I can't find, is filled with contradictions. Now, someone says, Caleb, why did you do this tonight? I did this because you and I have a common enemy, and it is not Carl Keith. 1 Peter 5, 8, you and I have this common enemy. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's 1 Peter 5, 8. I don't hate any of y'all. I've said this before. There's a lot of you. Do I love you? I love you. And then for some of y'all, I say, I don't just love you. I like you. Okay? Some of y'all don't know you well. Other people I've had more time with, I don't wish bad on you. We do this broadcast and we don't ask for money. We take a lot of heat and a lot of pushback. And all we're doing is trying to get you to be a better student of your Bible. Philippians 1.23, here's our common goal. I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. We have a common enemy. We have a common goal. We'd like to go to heaven together. But this is our problem that we all have right now. In Galatians 5.19-21, he says, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Is adultery wrong? Obviously. Fornication, sex outside of marriage? Obviously. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveling, such like. Those are all bad. Seditions and heresies are just as sinful as these other, other sins. And what is heresies? In Acts chapter 23, let's look at this. In Acts 24, in verse number 5, they said, We have found this man to be a pestilent fellow, a mover of the sedition among the Jews throughout all the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. That is the same Greek word translated in Galatians 5, verse number 20, as heresies. Religious division, partying up, creating the sects is sinful. That's why I did this broadcast tonight. No, I, look, you read this and you say, yeah, these are all bad, but y'all don't know what these are because your pastors are not really interested in teaching you the Bible. They are interested in basically keeping you comfortable with tradition and then keeping you happy enough that you keep putting in the plate. Now, all this was Bible conversation. Was it pressing? It was pressing. There's a reason why in Acts chapter 7 when they heard Stephen, they covered their ears, they gnashed their teeth, and they stoned him. And I think there are some people who say, well, I'd like to catch him, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that about you. <laughs> I have actually been in the grocery store before and seen Carl Keith switch lines. Was he trying to avoid me? I don't know. I don't think bad about Carl Keith. Uh, 
like I said at the beginning, Carl Keith is a man, and, you know, he's living in the world, and life is hard. So all I'm saying is life is hard. Don't go to hell on top of it. Be a real Christian. Stop promoting sectarianism and promote unity based on conformity to the New Testament text. This is all my info. Get in touch with us whatever way you can. We want to hear from you because we love you. Keep asking, what does the Bible say? Have a good night. God bless you.